Welcome to Leaders of the West, a podcast for innovators and change makers. I'm your host, Jesse Jarvis, the founder of Of the West, and I'm sitting down with agriculturalists, entrepreneurs, executives, and everyone in between with the goal of digging into the strategies, mindsets, and lessons that have been crucial to the success of ag and Western. Whether you're carrying on the next generation of your family's operation, starting something from scratch, or determined to climb up the leadership ladder, we're going to inspire you to continue to dream big, growing not just you, but the future of agriculture and Western as a whole. Let's go. Welcome to the first guest episode of Leaders of the West. I am beyond delighted today to be joined with industry leader, Katie Kaufman Blair, and we are going to dig into the strategies that she has used to build such a remarkable career in the world of commentary and broadcasting. But before we dig into Katie, with this being our first guest episode, I really want to give you guys a gentle reminder of what our goal is here with these guest episodes. So this is not going to be the traditional getting to know Katie interview and how she got to where she is today. I know that Katie has been a guest on a ton of other podcasts. And after this, if you are thinking, gosh, I loved her and I want to hear more of her life story and what led up to her career. I want to encourage you guys to go search her name and go give those a listen because I really want to foster a community of continued learners and listeners, especially when there are a lot of other great podcasts out there in our industry. Our goal with these guest episodes is to really dig into one or two topics of someone's life so that we can really deepen our understanding and have specific takeaways and hopefully the beginning steps to an actionable plan of how we can implement things into our lives, into our companies, whether they're a business that we own or a business that we work for. And in really honing in, instead of getting a broad overview of somebody, that also gives us the opportunity to invite guests back that you love so that we can talk about something new and still provide really, really good value. So I can guarantee that the first five to 10 guests are automatically going to get do-overs at some point as we grow and as we learn and as we perfect what we're doing here. So before we've gotten started, I can already tell you that Katie is coming back again in the future. But with that, let's get to our guest of the hour, somebody who I have personally looked up to for so long and still do and somebody who has became a very dear friend of mine, Katie. So Katie, for those of you who may not know you, can you give a quick synopsis of who you are and what you do and the incredible career that you have created in the world of broadcasting and commentary? Oh, Jesse, I don't know. I feel like this lead in this was too much for me. Thank you so much. I am so humbled to even be considered a guest on your podcast, much less one of the first. So I've looked up to you for a very long time. I think you are such a fierce businesswoman for not only agriculture, but the entire Western industry. And I echo all of your sentiments. And I just love that we're able to hang together because you definitely make me want to be a better person, uh, not only in my personal life, but professionally too. So congratulations on this podcast. I'm so happy for you. You know, I've been involved in the Western industry for quite some time, and it all started at a young age. I grew up on uh, my family's uh, small cow-calf operation. There was also a lot of horses there. I showed Western pleasure, reining, and cow horses all throughout my childhood up until I moved to Texas after I graduated college. In between that time, I ran for my hometown Rodeo Queen contest, Miss Clovis Rodeo, went on to Miss California Rodeo Salinas, went on to Miss Rodeo California, and then ultimately competed for the Miss Rodeo America title in winter of 2007 for the 2008 reign. So like I said, I've grown up in the industry. I have a lot of respect for every facet of it, from agriculture to professional rodeo and everything in between. And I think that's why I've stayed in it as long as I have is just the respect that I have for all the people who help put food on our tables. Well, I feel like you are not doing yourself enough justice. You are somebody who has worked a wide array of events and broadcasting, whether it is CBS Sports Network, NBC Sports Network, RFD, the Cowboy Channel, and so many more. And you've also interviewed Diane Keaton, which is just wild to me. 
But what really got you started and what were the key ingredients in setting yourself up to be such a trusted voice in Western sports? Gosh, well, I think back to when I was competing in rodeo queen competitions and pageants. And when I was Miss Rodeo Salinas, I will say that we did a lot of community service all throughout the city uh, in promotion for the California Rodeo Salinas that takes place every summer. However, they really utilized their Rodeo Queen for PR and just getting the word out of how great the rodeo is. And so I did countless newspaper interviews and TV interviews working up to that third weekend in July to promote the rodeo. And during that time and during my reign, I um, really came to love interacting with those reporters. But I always said to myself, I want to be the one asking the questions. I don't necessarily want to be the one answering. And I took that quite literally. So after I ran for Miss Rodeo America, I went back to college and got my degree in broadcast journalism from San Jose State. And then I interned at Superior Livestock Auction, which is the leading cattle auction company in the world. And at that time, they were housed uh, in the heart of Fort Worth, down in the stockyards. And I fell in love immediately with the city of Fort Worth and also the Fort Worth stockyards with the cowboys and culture that, that it has. And they always say this is where the West begins. And it, and it really, really does. I was at Superior Livestock for a little over four years right after I graduated I'm always quick to thank them and the leadership at Superior at that time for gifting me a live 30-minute show um, on RFD TV as soon as I graduated. And anyone that is listening that is in the process of getting their degree or has a passion for journalism totally understands and knows that that is so uncommon right when you graduate college. I had so many fellow colleagues from from college that were going to news stations, whether it was in Bozeman, Montana or Portland, Oregon, or just go down the list. And they're, you know, reporting on the 10 or 11 o'clock news at night and hoping for a 15 to 20 second hit of some, you know, news that had just happened there in that day, which I'm not saying that that's not great practice. It totally is. I'm just wanting to show how wild it was that I was given a 30 minute live show that I had to fill on my own post college. And so I feel like I was thrown into the trenches really fast, but I think that's also where I tend to thrive as someone who's always wanting to achieve excellence. And so I think that foundation at Superior really set me up for a lot of the continued success that I had with broadcast opportunities after that. I remember the Superior Sunrise days. But you know, you bring up a really good point. So when you first started out in this field, how did you really set that objective? Obviously, somebody didn't necessarily call you one day and said, hey, we'd like you to handle broadcasting of this event. So what kind of kickstarted that? Was it was it Superior Sunrise? Or what really put that purpose and intention out there even moving forward after that? Sure. So I guess I should back up just a minute because I had my first TV experience and opportunity really before I got to Superior Livestock Auction. And it was for a show that was on RFD TV and it was called TV Horse Source at the time. And the gal who started it had such a great vision and it was really going to be like an online auction or preview for horses, but it was almost like a little too ahead of its time, really. And now we say that in 2023 and everyone's like, oh my gosh, brilliant, duh, we're doing that all over Facebook or wherever else. But really at the time in 2008, we just really weren't quite there yet. But so I had my first you know, dabbling into TV uh, then. And I really thought to myself, you know, when I go to Superior, I'm just going to see what opportunities unfold. And I am the first to say that I'm not a creative person. Like I don't think of these grandiose ideas and, you know, storyboard everything and, you know, come up with the next best thing. I, I'm not that person, but I am someone who is task oriented. And if you just point me in the right direction, if I'm 110% behind it, I'm going to help you achieve it. And I'm going to give you my absolute best. And so when this live 30 minute show was kind of being discussed about, Hey, like how can we kind of get everyone excited or pumped up or be able to talk about the cattle market before we actually go live into the cattle auction? What if we did like a short 10 to 15 minute preview prior to, and Katie, do you think that you would, you know, be willing to host that? And what does that look like to you? And The minute they gave me that type of runway is kind of when I just 
blew the doors off and thought, we can totally do this. And that's really how Superior Sunrise was born. And I was like, let's not make it 10 minutes. Let's do a whole 30 minute show. We had so many great clients and buyers and consigners alike, you know, not to mention some of the guys who have been at Superior forever. You know, I, I hosted with, you know, the quintessential auctioneer of our time, Ralph Wade, uh, time and time again, and I had a lot of fun doing it. And so I don't know, I just took that idea and ran with it. And, you know, I, I, I don't follow along too much anymore. I, I assume they still have Superior Sunrise up and going. But nonetheless, it was really fun to start that back in 2011, I guess. They do still have that on before their auction. So what is that, a 11 to a 12 year reign so far? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but honestly, that is just such a testament to who you are and how you do create things. You are one of the most organized, just you have all of everything scheduled and you are, you demand perfection and you are perfection in that, you know, what you, what you expect, you also exude and, and that says a lot about you. And it is honestly no surprise that that show is still running just based on the foundation that you gave it. So we've, we've really gotten into the, the beginning of that, but then kind of what happened next after that and how, um, obviously the NFR is a huge part of your story. So how did all of that come about? Well, I mentioned it earlier, and then you kind of just touched on it again. And the more that I look back at what I've done thus far and all the things that I still want to be able to do in my career is that if I'm 110% behind something, I'm going to make sure that it gets done and that it gets done really well. And I always say that I'm striving for excellence. I don't think I'm ever going to achieve excellence. I'm pretty hard on myself. I'm probably my own toughest critic, but I wear that proudly knowing that excellence is always going to be in the future for me. Like I'm always going to think of ways to do something better. That's just who I am in my nature. With that, I think mentors are also really, really important. And I think that just speaks to who I am about always constantly learning and always wanting to do better. And you can't do better without always constantly getting constructive feedback. I am a huge proponent of feedback. I've done TV I think for a fairly long time now. And I expect someone, whoever's hired me at the end of wherever I've been hired to say, hey, I thought you did these things well, but here's some areas that if we work together again, I'd really like to see you improve. Or I didn't really like how this went. I wish that it went like this. So maybe we can work on that in the future. I think that's the only way that we continue to push ourselves and reach new expectations for each other and just continue to make greatness mentors have been a huge part of my life, Jesse. And I know that you are someone that walks the same path that I do. I know you have many of your mentors in your own right. And whether I have personal mentors who are helping shape me as a person, or I have mentors where I'm really asking a lot of hard hitting questions about my professional path, I think it is vital. It doesn't have to be your parents. It doesn't even have to be family members. But I've had really strategic mentors throughout my life who have helped shape me to who I am today. And I give all of them really the credit on any of the success that I've had thus far. And I hope to continue to have, you know, different and exciting success in the future. And I, and I know that I have more mentors who are coming down the pipeline who I haven't even met yet. You know, you talk about something that is so important, and that is surrounding yourself with other people who are going to push you. A lot of that is obviously born out of your network, but I do want to hit on that mentor piece just a, a bit more because obviously you you brought that up and it is so, so important in what we do. How do you go about identifying a mentor? And the reason that I ask that is, is I think that so many people, especially younger generations, they have a hard time figuring out who they should go approach or they want to approach the person who is maybe in a higher place. And I don't want to say for the wrong reasons, but there are a lot of great mentors that maybe aren't as, as like bright and shiny, if you will. How do you go find those people and then put yourself out there to say, Hey, I would love your insight, but also still being mindful of their time? Yeah, that's a great question. I have mentors who are bright and shiny and and that are very widely recognized um, in the Western industry. But I also have some mentors who are more behind the scenes or maybe some people who aren't even in the Western industry at all. And the one that really comes to mind for me is specific to this question is a college professor of mine when I was at San Jose State 
he had the biggest impact on my life in that chapter for sure. And gosh, I graduated back in 2010 and we still keep in touch, not nearly like I would like, but I know he's only a phone call or an email away. And I chose him as a mentor and you don't really, I didn't really seek him out. It was more of everything that I was learning from him along the way where I was like, man, this is someone who I really need to bounce ideas off of. And, you know, he and I couldn't be more different in terms of how we live our lives, our religious beliefs, our political beliefs, you know, the type of people we hang out with. But what I loved about him so much was that he really showed me another side of the coin that maybe sometimes I wasn't looking at. And it could be about anything, but it was always just providing a different perspective. I didn't necessarily have to agree with him, but just being open to differing opinions and how he saw conflict and saw resolution and just his insight was so profound. And I don't know, like, he forever changed me as a person in the best way. And I know he knows that, but you know, he wasn't someone that maybe is widely known, but I would argue to say that he had the biggest impact on the way that I shaped my career path post-college without question. And that was someone that I was just taking a class from, but it became so much more than that. And he really made an impression in my life that I'll have with me forever. It is so important to really, to always be looking for mentors because you don't necessarily know where you're going to find them. And you bring up another great point about, and this also does not surprise me about you. This is the type of person that you are is instead of looking at all of the things that maybe you didn't agree on, you see the more important, like, this is how this person can provide me value. I can get past the other stuff. And that is something that so few people in our world these days are able to do, unfortunately. But that is one of the reasons that you have made it to where you are today. But let's get back to network. So obviously on a personal level, I know that you have built an extremely strong network, both personally and professionally, but how much of where you are today do you credit to really creating and cultivating that network? Yeah, I credit a lot of the relationships I've built over the last, you know, honestly, two decades, which is so wild to say that because I feel like just yesterday I was running for Miss <laughs> Globus Rodeo and that is not the case at all. <laughs> but saying that to say the Western industry is a small network and the people who are in it probably have been in it for a very long time and they have much more wisdom than all of us who are up and comers or have been in the industry for only 10 or 20 years. And how lucky are we to still have those people to help guide us and the industry as a whole? It's really, really cool. And there are people who I met when I was 17 years old at the Clovis Rodeo that I still see. I still see them literally 20 years later. And I think that that speaks volumes and... I would be remiss if I didn't say, I'm sure so many of them are like, oh gosh, I've known Katie for years and oh gosh, yeah, she's changed a little bit, but she's kind of still the same Katie I've always known. And I'm always okay when people say that I've changed because I hope you're changing. Like I'm not someone who's scared of change. I'm always changing. I'm always evolving. You know, if you really want to get into my career, you know, if you put all the television stuff aside, I have full-time jobs, you know, that I do day in and day out. And if you look at that career path, I've completely changed industries every four to five years because I love that. I love learning something new and I love being challenged with something that I'm not used to. And so, you know, just going back to those people that I've always, always known, I think at the end of the day, you're only as strong as your network. I feel like I have a pretty, pretty good network. And I'd like to think that they would all say to me, gosh, you know what? When Katie says she's going to do something, she does it. And I think that's why I've continued to be hired throughout the years for different events is I hope I don't embarrass anyone. I hope I do the job that I they've hired me to do. But at the end of the day, I'd like to think that I always do what I say I'm going to do and I always deliver what they expect. Again, you, you've had so many mic drop moments so far. You are such a, a wealth of knowledge. I know that we have some listeners. There's two different types that I consistently get questions from specifically when it comes to networks. Usually it's somebody who is A, just starting out in their career. So they are maybe right out of high school, right out of college, very, very early on. 
Or it's somebody who is making a pivot in life and they realize that their current network doesn't support their long-term goals. So keeping those two people in mind, what kind of advice or tips would you give them in where to start building a strong network? So people who are just coming out of high school or just coming out of college, I can't stress enough that don't ever say no to an opportunity. And whether it's writing a script, running a teleprompter, running camera, being a grip somewhere, helping run cable for a production, anything that you can get your hands on to be there and to learn, I think is so important. And with that will come friendships, will come learning experiences. And then ultimately, you're going to continue to be around those people. They're going to see what a hard worker you are, because I don't care what anyone says. You have to put in the work. You have to work really, really hard. You have to work harder than you think you need to. And at the end of the day, you also have to be humble and be ready to put the time in. And it's really tiring. But I think being humble and taking opportunities as they come, whatever that looks like, and don't set high expectations of, you know, being on camera, your first opportunity, be there, be in the environment, start to really understand what it takes to make it all work. And I promise if you come in humbly and you come in with a great work ethic and a desire to learn, you're going to get the opportunity you want. It's only a matter of time. It's to the ones who think that they can just come in and show up, be on camera, say bye, not offer to help, not offer you know, to set gear up, tear gear down. Those are the people who I have a really hard time showing support to or mentoring because I think you've really got to earn your stripes and it takes work. Oh, it absolutely does. And And two, when you have that knowledge, that then makes you stronger, right? And I can also tell you that, and anybody can tell you this, hard workers are uh, non-existent these days, or at least seem to be so. So if you work hard, you are instantly putting yourself light years ahead of everybody else because nobody's willing to do that anymore. That is the one thing that you can consistently do that is going to take you to the top. Absolutely. Or just set yourself apart. And it's really not that hard, especially for all of us who grew up with an ag background. My gosh. I mean, you know, I think that work ethic and responsibility and accountability came to all of us at such a young age, whether it was taking care of 4-H animals, FFA, or helping feed, you know, the cattle that you had out in the feed barns, whatever that looks like. We already have that built in us. And so when you're going up for jobs or other opportunities, I know the people that are in the Western industry, they are going to put their best foot forward and they're already going to be ahead of their competition. Oh, you are spot on there. Okay. So we did talk about the, you have to work hard. You have to be there. You have to be willing to do kind of the uglier stuff. I do get a lot of younger people thinking that they want an on-air or a commentary type position because they see the glamour side of it, right? But I think that you can attest to the fact that there is a lot more that goes on behind the scenes. So what are some things that people need to consider when looking into the field of Western sports commentary? What is maybe the not so glamorous? I don't know if I would call it not so glamorous, but there's just, I love every aspect of television. I love running camera. I love being, you know, writing scripts. I'm really too scared to run a teleprompter because that's like the worst job in America because you're never, no one's ever happy with you. It's either too fast or too slow, but I still will run it if I, if I absolutely have to. However, television, there's just a lot of moving pieces that make it all happen, right? And you just have to go with the flow and you have to really do your homework. I think personally, if you are someone who's going to be on camera, uh, whether it's taped or live live, you know, there's different elements to both of those, but it comes with nerves, comes with some excitement. There's a lot of hurry up and wait. And you just have to, I don't know, like I said, you just go with the flow, right? You never want to be the one that's rocking the boat or being impatient because TV just takes time. And, and I don't know, I feel like I'm pretty easygoing, especially in, in those settings, because it's a lot of early mornings and it can be into really, really late nights. You know, for example, 
I just had the opportunity to cover the American qualifiers and the American this year. It was my first time to ever be able to do that specific series of rodeos, which uh, was such an aha moment for me. Really excited that I was able to, you know, do my best for the team. But you know, there were some night in, in Lexington. We didn't get out of there until one thirty or two a.m. because we were having to fix some stuff because it was taped. It wasn't live, live, and um, it's easy to get frustrated probably in those <laughs> scenarios, but you just have to ride the wave and it all works itself out, I guess. What has been a a struggle that you've had to overcome in your career or maybe like a scarier professional moment for you? You know, I know it's cliche to say this, but I really don't live with a lot of regrets. I always try to see, you know, if there's ever been a blimp on the radar of disappointment that I just chalk it up as a lessons learned and then hopefully not make the same mistake again and just continue to better myself and better the craft that, you know, I've been hired to do. But I don't know. I don't know if I have really one moment that really sticks out to me that was a huge struggle, I guess, professionally. I will say on on a personal side, and maybe you've heard this story and or, or maybe you haven't, but you know, when I was running for Miss Rodeo America, I had worked so hard and I really believed in my heart that I was going to win Miss Rodeo America. I did not have a plan B. And I think most who know me, or if you're getting to know me, I am a planner and uh, a little bit of a control freak and a little bit of a perfectionist, actually a lot of it for perfectionist. <laughs> and so I like to kind of have everything planned out, no surprises. And I always think of all of the, okay, if this happens, then what? If this, then that. I'm pretty good at kind of working all those scenarios out. And I didn't have that at Miss Rodeo America because I I really believed in my heart that I had worked so hard that I had put myself in a position to win. When I didn't win, that was hard for me. I didn't have a plan B. I had no idea what I was going to do. I didn't intend on going back to college. I'm the first college graduate on my mom's side of the family, and I wear that very proudly. And I'm not saying that I don't have supportive parents. I have the best parents, I think, in the universe who have supported me endlessly with whatever I've wanted to do, but they didn't really push college. And so after the Miss Rodeo America pageant, I had to really sit back and think, what am I going to do? I mean, I had this all planned out that I was going to travel for the next year, continue to focus and and create a deeper network and maybe have some job opportunities. You know, I didn't know if TV was going to be in the future, whether it was something in marketing. I didn't really know, but I was going to figure it out. And I had to figure out plan B really fast. And I'm the first to say that not winning Miss Rodeo America was the best thing that could have happened to me. At the time, I don't think I could have heard anyone say that to me because I was pretty devastated. But looking back on who I was and who I am now or my career path or the opportunities that I've had over the last 20 years, I mean, I really rest knowing it was the best thing that happened to me. I went back to school. I got my degree. um, I put my best foot forward with whatever venture I was wanting to achieve. I was a huge goal setter, still am. My goals look a little bit different now, but it was almost like the spark that I needed to say, this isn't for you. I've got something else in mind and it's going to be a lot better. And it was, it is. Life's good. Oh, that is, that is such a rewarding thing to hear. And I know that so many people are sitting in those same shoes because it's so easy to get our sights set on something. And then when life kind of puts up that roadblock, it's really hard for us to want to get off path and onto a new one because that's where our sights were set. But I think another thing that you had said earlier that really goes back into that is always being somebody who says yes, because you never know where those yeses are going to take you in life. And I am the same way. I am a very goal-oriented person and and I definitely like to plan things out. We always joke that I am like type AAA. But I can also say that the best things in life that have happened to me have came when I thought that they were probably at the worst in the sense of not necessarily on my radar or on my plan. And I know so many people out there are going through that same thing. So if that's one of you who's out there listening, just know something 
better is definitely ahead. Both Katie and I can attest to it. Yeah, definitely on the horizon. You just got to look for it. Well, speaking of looking for things, do you have any final thoughts or wisdom that you want to impart on listeners about the future of agriculture and Western industries? Well, I think that so many of your listeners are already making such a difference in the ag industry or the Western industry, respectively. And I know they kind of are two in the same. I will say that I think that now is as important of a time as ever that we need to continue to share the ag story and where food comes from and the importance of ranching, the importance of farming, and just not letting the story of all of that get away from us. Because if we're not sharing it, no one else is. I don't think that we have a ton of advocates outside of our own industry right now. And we have to be our own advocates, if you will. And I think there are numerous opportunities with the endless social media platforms that are available to all of us and continue to be a huge proponent and share the story so we can keep this life and this industry that we love so much front and center and continuing to grow uh, for generations to come. Because now that I'm a mom, I promise you that I want Cal to be able to grow up in an environment of agriculture, ranching, the Western way of life, and the fundamentals of a rancher, farmer, and a cowboy. Because I think each one of those individuals puts their best boot forward, has manners, treats people with respect, and their word is still as good as their handshake. And it's really rare to be able to say that about any other culture. Well, I can guarantee that with you and Elliot, two T's, as parents, Cal has absolutely no other way that he is going to turn out. You are two of the best people, you know, personally and professionally that I know. And I'm so thankful that we were able to get to know you a little bit more here today. And we have officially wrapped up our very first guest episode of Leaders of the West. Katie, where can people find you at online? Sure. Really, the only uh, social media I have is Instagram. I ditched Facebook uh, probably 10 years ago. Felt like I didn't need a lot of those keyboard warriors in my life. So if you want to hang out or visit, you can find me on Instagram. Perfect. Well, we'll make sure to drop that handle in the show notes so that you guys can go follow along with Katie and see what is next for her um, and where you can watch her on TV or all of those good things. So if this episode was helpful to you guys, it could definitely be for others. So to help spread the word about this podcast, take a screenshot of this episode, add it to your Instagram stories, tag me, tag of the West, tag Katie, all three of us, it doesn't matter. And be sure to hit follow or subscribe so that you never miss an episode. We will see you guys next week. If you loved this episode, do us a favor and share it with someone else who might find just as much value in it as you did. We're on a mission to continue to grow and strengthen the future of agriculture and Western industries. And you spreading the word helps us make more of a positive impact. It also makes a big difference when you take a minute to go rate and review the show. We can't thank you enough for listening, for sharing, and for loving Ag and Western as much as we do. We'll see you back here for our next episode.